you know, there was a rip in the fabric because of uh, Vietnam, because of civil rights, because of the women's liberation. There's a rip right through the core of American fabric at almost every level. And, um, and everybody was engaged in some way or another. You know, even those who were on the far conservative end of the spectrum, they were still engaged in these debates, you know. And so it affected everyone, and, uh, and it demanded action. Underneath all of the silliness, there were three major revolutions, and they justified the word revolution. There was the, the, the black unwillingness to accept second-class citizenship any longer. There was the American youth unwillingness to let their elders drag them into an, a war that was unjustified and to murder their young men and murder strangers on the other side of the world for no reason except, you know. And then there was the women's movement, which was a movement of, of such profound and significant and everlasting um, aspects, not just of women's lives, but of human lives, that made us focus on truths about ourselves that uh, had been buried in the 50s and in the 40s and all the way back. Had been, society had been so constricted and so structured and so ruled by a certain frightened male structure that the freedom that came from that, the personal freedom to make choices, to have your own life, to be in touch with your own life. There was something about those days that was so wonderful and so at the risk of being terribly corny, so full of love. We, we really loved each other. And the more we got to know each other, the more we loved each other rather than less. That I think for all of us, those days are burned in our minds as not just our halcyon days, but the, but the, the apex of, of, our, of our times of happiness and the sense of belonging and the sense of community and sense of all sorts of things that got lost later on. We were all in this bubble, uh, you know, because no, who knew what was going to happen to the country? It was the Nixon thing, Vietnam, and there was this whole radical edge to things, and there was enough radical people in L.A. that th th there was a sense of anarchy about things, that you didn't really think of the future. You didn't see the big beast coming down the boulevard, you know, that was going to swallow everything up. and and be corporate. There was no sense that the corporations were going to take over, at least not with me or anyone I knew. We were incredibly innocent. We were going along San Sunset Boulevard. And I thought, oh, this is paper mache. I mean, this was made yesterday. It's all so vulgar. It's all so... There's nothing quaint about it. There's no age to it. There's no brick. There's no intelligence brought to the architecture of any kind, I almost threw up. And then that, that was my first impression of Los Angeles. And I think L.A. was the last little pocket of the frontier. There was a sense that you could go out there and invent your life, that you could, uh, anything was possible. And I think the frontier after Vietnam it was all closed, it, it was ended. You know, Vietnam was a frontier idea in a way. And in the 80s, with Ray, when Reagan came in, that whole thing was over. The whole idea of America, the whole possibility of America is being, ha having an endless frontier, the kind of romanticism of that idea, it's, it's, it doesn't exist now. It's all backed up on itself. So uh, that's what the world used to get from America, this sense from American films that there was this possibility to reinvent yourself, to become what you were, your dream, so to speak. Now the dream is dreaming you. you we're, America's being dreamed, it's not dreaming, you know, and it's being dreamed by corporations. People look back at it fondly as the golden age. I, I don't think it was the golden age. The golden age ended in 1962, but we had a, a, a new birth of freedom, so to speak, to quote, uh, uh, to misquote uh, Lincoln. but. Um, we all sort of blew it in many different ways, but we all, you know, everybody's still working, everybody's still trying to work, and, uh, um, you know, movies have become richer and poorer, but uh, 
the medium will prevail. It wasn't as if there were, were, was a house full of drugged people having orgies, which became part of the myth, and it was simply not true. Uh, if you did something like LSD or MDA, it, you made a, a, an event of it because you were going to go into this quasi-religious place in the absence of any real religion till Eureka came along, God save us. Uh, and, and, and you made a, it, it, was a, it was an event that you, you treated with respect. So every so often there would be, we're going to take LSD and see what we learn about ourselves and the universe. And it was clearly free your mind, you know. Uh, and that, you know, the, the reason the government is against drugs is because when you do drugs, you open your mind up and you see life as it actually is, and then you upset the system. So drugs in and of themselves are the you know, essence of the counterculture. There was a rampant sexuality. So as connected with that sexuality, there was the breakdown of the marriages that had, uh, in the 50s, whether they were authentic or not. And w no matter what was going on behind, it seemed that part of the 60s rebellion against that was to allow yourself to, to go wherever you wanted. And it was expected that women would just sort of accept that. Uh, it was not yet understood that women, therefore, had the right to do the same thing. I, I don't know. I used to think, like, I'd be proud of myself that I was one of the few women in Hollywood who has not had sex with uh, Jack Nicholson or Warren Beatty. Somehow managed to avoid that, so far anyway. Maybe I've really missed something great, but it's, it ain't too late yet. <laughs> I enjoyed that joke. Sleeping with somebody was, you know, not a commitment. That's all. It was just that simple. I don't think it was anything uh, more complicated than that. Everybody was fucking everybody. I don't know if you can say that on this thing, but everybody was fucking everybody. It was, I know that, and everybody was smoking dope, and everybody was experimenting with drugs. I know that. Um, I went to parties with Peter at Sue Menger's house, and everybody was openly smoking marijuana, and Paul Newman and Joanne, Joanne was sitting there knitting, and when they saw that everybody was smoking dope, they left the party. Some people didn't smoke. Yeah. Some people just, you know, were strongly opposed to it. I mean, I remember specifically Milius and and Spielberg said, this is not for me. It wasn't, but there were, yeah, most people smoked. Most people smoked pot. Brian didn't take drugs. Uh, he drank. We all drank a great deal of almond and red and West Coast Zip. Uh, Stephen didn't take drugs at all, and I don't think ever has. It all made him very nervous. Uh, Marty did, um, and he smoked pot. Harvey smoked pot. Michael and Julia certainly smoked pot and did coke, but we didn't know they were doing coke until she wrote her book. And everybody's response to the book was similar in that, God, I thought we were having a good time. What is this? It was the happiest time of my life. What is this horribly depressing book about a coke addict and some criminals up the road? There's all this publicity about Bob's sets and smoking dope and doing nothing. Nothing was done on set. At the end of the day, during the screening of dailies, or at a party at his house, or, you know, people broke out whatever substances pleased them. Very honestly, I did a lot of drugs, and but basically I was an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink in 20 years, or any hard narcotics in 20 years. I do uh, puff a joint every once in a while, but that's uh, nice and relaxing for me doesn't lead to harder stuff in my case. So, uh, but the drinking was really bad. I used to joke and say, hey, the drugs are just covering up the fact that I'm an alcoholic, ha, ha, ha. But in point of fact, I was an alcoholic and I, I did drink all day long. I would, first thing I'd do in the morning is reach for a beer and, uh, and I decided that if I mix my drinks all day, I could still stand at the end of the evening, which is true. And uh, so then I'd do Coke so I could drink more. <laughs> But it, it was a, it was a, that, that was a, a bad, uh, bad syndrome of, uh, of self-destruct. But if you're not creating and you're a compulsive creator and uh, that's all there really is, uh, it, 
uh, you know, can get you to your emotional breakdowns where you can actually cry and <laughs> feel sorry for yourself or whatever, or get angry or whatever, but it's, a, it's an endless road. My biggest issues with drugs came during the cocaine days, and they drove you nuts because you're trying to establish one kind of energy and this other electric, uh, metallic, awful um, rage is working against you at every turn. We, did, we barely knew what coke was. Yeah, in the 70s were... Uh, Except for, I think it's in uh, Peter's book, that when, we, when Peter Boyle brought coke right. over and we didn't yeah. know what you're supposed to Here's do with it. Didn't, isn't that in the book when we passed it around and then we knew there was a straw involved and so we we stuck the straw in no we stuck the straw in the thing oh okay and then you snort that was all we knew <laughs> this letter shows up it's literally the kind of thing you see in a psycho movie with pasted cut out letters on a piece of paper and says if little Jody wins the Academy Award for what you made her do, you will die. And, you know, Jody Foster was up for Academy Award for Taxi Driver, Best Supporting Actress, and this is like a scary thing to get. And so Stephen Prince immediately goes into action and says, I'm calling the FBI. And Marty just got this letter and it's like psycho and they said, we'll be right over. And, and Marty says, uh, excuse me, Stephen, there's like 10 grams of cocaine in this office and you're bringing the FBI in here? What are so they sent for some poor flunky assistant film editor to bring over a big film. And the guy who literally walked out with a cocaine stash as the FBI walks in. And the FBI looks at the thing and, you know, puts it in the plastic envelope and everything and they say, don't worry, Mr. Scorsese. We'll be with you 24-7 from now on. <laughs> and Marty's at this point like, oh, great, just what I need, right? So his only way of getting out of it was to go on location scouts, right? You tell the FBI guy, you guys go in that car. I'll go in this car. You follow me, right? And he tucked down. It was like crazy. So fortunately, the Academy Awards came in about 14 days, and Jody didn't win, and so they figured the thing was over, and Marty could come back to being totally insane. There was a time when it was totally cool and great and part of your life, although many people, most people, didn't do it. And then it became this really icky thing that had become more important than it should have, and no one was in a very good mood anymore, and it was really irritable, and it was impinging on your life, and it killed people, destroyed people. It really wasn't until Belushi's death, till John died, that, and I remember, I remember he, when I heard John died, it was at Universal at the time, so he walked down the hall, and I, my first reaction was, that's it, the game's up, it's over, you know, because we, everyone was feeling that, Something's going wrong here with all this drug use, and we can't sustain itself much longer, you know. And then finally, John's death made it official. You know, it was over. UA had created a world that the majors were not aware of, and supported by Lou Wasserman and Abe Lasvogel, who were the top agents at the time. Um, they snuck in the back door because the studios had no idea what UA was really doing. And the concept of giving the filmmaker creative autonomy was something the studios could never have lived with. As long as the films were on budget and you know, kept to the script, uh, the creators had final cut. And we subrogated our personalities, our egos, whatever you want, to the films and the filmmakers. We were able literally to attract any filmmaker that we really wanted to be in business with. Uh, the studios didn't operate that way. Studios controlled everything. The studios looked at dailies every day. I mean, I was responsible for our productions from 62 through 72 and 3. 
And I may have seen dailies once or twice when I was visiting a location, but that's it. Nobody sat all day in committees looking at film, saying, oh my God, you know, the makeup doesn't look right here. I mean, we trusted, whether it was Preminger or Kramer or Jewison or Wilder or Sergio Leone or Ingmar Bergman. I mean, the entire range uh, of filmmakers that we were in business with to make their films, we believed totally they would make them better than we would. I got a call one day from uh, John Schlesinger in London saying that a young friend of his had given him a little paperback book and it was a tough book. I mean, he, he didn't know what to make of it, but he really liked it. He really wanted to do it. And he was uncertain. And would I give him a second opinion? So I got the book. It was Midnight Cowboy. And I read it. And I mean, certainly recognized that it would be difficult. It was not what you would call a traditional book uh, or a traditional movie. But this was that time of ferment when no one knew what was quite going to work. Uh, and I certainly felt that in John's hands, it could be a marvelous little, I thought it was going to be a little picture about these two, these two guys, you know, stumbling their way through life and, and touching. But I thought it would be very hard to get it financed. I found out much, much later, he didn't tell me about this until the film was practically done, he had first taken it to an Italian producer in England, Joe Yanni, who was his dear friend, wonderful guy, and the man who found him and gave him his first couple of opportunities to direct. Uh, and Yanni had said, it's terrible, it's disgusting. If you do that, you'll never work again. You'll be called, you'll be a faggot. Well, you don't want to make a faggot movie. So John was at a real low ebb. My marriage had just ended. My wife had announced that I was spending all my time working on my projects, <laughs> which had never seemed to get off. And uh, she left, took my kids with me, and went back to New York. and ultimately remarried. Uh, so I was there. I was desperate and sad. Schlesinger was there. He was desperate and sad. He was convinced that his career was over. And Waldo was there, was desperate and sad, because he had been on the verge of committing suicide a year or two earlier, and it only stopped when his daughter said to him, hey, Dad, if you're going to kill yourself, kill yourself for something worthwhile. Write something good instead of all this crap, Taris Bulba and all that crap you're writing. So we were like three desperate, and <laughs> we were three desperate characters. And uh, we went to work, and it was a wonderful. I'd never worked that way quite before. The three of us met every day, and we talked each movement of the script out. They were trying to find Midnight Cowboy. You know, they were trying to cast the role of Joe Buck. And um, I had seen John Voight in a play at the uh, Theatre Company of Boston when I was doing a play at the Charles Playhouse. So I, I thought he was a great actor and I began pushing everybody to look at him. And I'm not the only one that brought him up. Obviously Marion Doherty, the casting person, uh, loved him as well. But it, it, uh, for some reason I, it, it became my cause. And so when John Schlesinger wanted to see if I was right for one of the parts in the script and I had to have a meeting with him, you know, my dad set up a meeting, um, I didn't know what to talk about. So I just began blathering about John Voight and what a great actor he was. I'd never met him or anything. I just had a feeling he'd be a good Joe Buck. So, so there was a kind of um, chemistry between me and, and John and me and John Schlesinger, and we all just sort of became a family, really. And uh, John and I became a couple. Uh, everywhere we went, everything we saw, it went in the movie. Every time we saw someone drop dead in the street, it went in the movie. Every time we saw some really crazy thing that fit within the context of the story we were trying to tell, it went in the movie. I mean, it was a constant process of improvisation and expansion and enlargement and we tried everything under the sun. It was thrilling, most thrilling time I've ever had in my life. And, uh, and we sensed we were onto something. We, we, were, we were scared because it was so weird. I remember once in Texas when uh, John was finishing with John Voight and 
Schlesinger was running with sweat and it was like 120 out there and all that. And he said that, he said, who the fuck is gonna see this shitty movie? He said, about a fucking dishwasher who goes to New York and fucks a lot of women. <laughs> he says, no one's gonna wanna see this. And uh, John Boyd confessed later that he thought, Jesus Christ, I'm finished, I'm ruined. I'm a dishwasher who's going to New York to fuck rich women. So in any event, uh, we finished the film. It was a long, long time finishing. And by that time, UA was pissed. We were several hundred thousand dollars over. We were weeks over. I mean, we really worked cheap. And uh, they want to see it. They were ready to see it. We were ready to show it. It was a rough job, we had, but it was pretty much the finished product. And uh, they invite us down, or David Picker, really. David Picker invites everyone from United Artists. <laughs> Instead of like two people looking at it and then telling it, he invites everybody. Now this guy hasn't seen a frame, but he believes. He invites everyone, Krim, Picker, everybody and all up and down the line, senior executives and office boys and all that, invite us to this uh, screening over on the west side of Manhattan. And John and I went over in a taxi, I remember, and we were, we were very frightened. And we pull up in front of this big screening room over on the west side, Fox, I believe. And as I'm about to get out of the cab, John grabs me by the arm, like in a clench of steel, and he says, now tell me the truth, dear boy. Do you really believe that anyone in his right mind will pay good money to see this rubbish? <laughs> of course, I didn't know what the hell to say. I said, I don't know, I don't know. We go up in the elevator, we go inside, there's total silence, no one greets us. I think maybe David Picker did, but Krim and the others are like, you know, we're, we're persona non grata. They don't want to see us. We're late. We're over budget. We're over schedule. You know, fuck you. you know, okay, we'll see the movie. So the movie starts, <laughs> and you can hear a pin drop. And inside of just a few minutes, everyone is like totally in the movie. They're in the movie. You can tell that they're in the movie, but we still don't know what to expect. Picture ends. There's a moment of silence, and then the whole place stands up and erupts in this amazing kind of celebration. And suddenly we were the golden boys, <laughs> Arthur Krim and, uh, and, and uh, David's uncle, I, I don't remember his name at the moment, uh, Mr. Picker, they come over and they want to take us to lunch. This is a masterpiece. I mean, they literally were using words like that. Andrew Saris was writing and Pauline Kael was writing and they were arguing and Dwight MacDonald was in there and then in Esquire writing about and then Stanley Kaufman. It was a ferment and interest. It was really marvelous. People subscribed to The New Yorker just, just to read pa Pauline Kael. Thanks to the beginning to the to the new wave critics at the Cahiers de Cinema and other people and some people in American criticism, notably Andrew Saris. You know, you're often credited as bringing the auteur theory over here and blamed for bringing the auteur theory over here. Well, either I'm credited for bringing it over or blamed for bringing it over, or else people say, oh, I just copied the French, you know, it wasn't me, it, was, it wasn't anything original that I did. And, and I, I would be the first to give them credit because they had a unique historical uh, you know, uh, unique historical, you know, the horror, you know, the horror of Nazi occupation. They couldn't see any American movies for five years. And so when the Cinematheque came on and began showing them one after the other, they had a context that we didn't have over here. You know, they could make links between uh, Orson Welles' Citizen Kane 1941 and, uh, and, uh, uh, Retro Rossellini's Open City in 1945-46. I mean, they, they could pull them all together. So that gave them, gave them an edge. Uh, it gave them an opportunity to, to, 
to, to demonstrate this theory in practice. I had a church background and uh, I got interested in films because the church uh, had prohibited it. And so in order to see films, I came up uh, here to Columbia uh, one summer and uh, through a, just a kind of serendipitous quirk, uh, I met Pauline and uh, she became my mentor and got me into UCLA Film School and got me working as a film critic. Pauline was a extremely vital force in, uh, in uh, film criticism and uh, extremely influential for a number of reasons. Pauline wrote for the New Yorker. What did Sarah, who did write? Village Voice. Village Voice, of course. And so you have already, you've got rivaling. You've got uptown and downtown, you know, and very different points of view. We were closer together than, uh, you know, ideologically. When I finally met her, I mean, we, we just didn't get along personally, but um, her, her view was that I was, uh, I had carried something to extremes. Pauline is this, has this very populist notion, uh, and Andy has this Eurocentric notion. And I always said, you know, that the, my pathetic little theory was the first step, not the last stop. You know, I made all kinds of disclaimers. You had two very good writers, uh, and uh, uh, they both benefited by the battle. She did me a favor by making me a monster. She made me much more popular, much more famous, or infamous, or notorious, or whatever, but people took notice that they'd never taken before when I was seemed reasonable. You know, you know, if I had seemed reasonable, or had been presented as reasonable, nobody would bother. You know, Pauline is essentially the Western maverick, the, you know, the girl from the Sacramento Valley, and. Andy is the New York City maverick. Uh, they're both in some ways against the New York intellectual establishment, read Jewish establishment, read um, the Lionel Trilly world. Uh, but uh, so they're, they're, they're two hot guns, but they're firing in different ways. They were like the Bickersons in print. And on a weekly basis, you had this, again, we go back to energy. They were given free license to let her rip. She said basically that uh, we all liked a certain type of action movie. We were all, uh, she, 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 she said some, she made a nasty uh, suggestions, you know, that we were all, you know, we were all, we all love these action heroes, you know, because we were, uh, and uh, so we, she was sort of suggesting we were all gay. They fought amongst themselves and would carry on these great dialogues about, no, you're wrong, yes, you're, you're absolutely wrong, 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 and it was great. And it was fun to, um, see that battle, and people who actually cared about it. The, the auteur theory, that was the word I used, and that got me into a lot of trouble, the theory, the idea of theory. But now, you know, it's like gestalt, you know, that, that is a thing that died from success, you know, because everybody completely absorbed it. And, you know, that's the auteur theory. Now, now it's ridiculous. Everybody uses the word. I hardly ever use it. I very seldom use it. Working on a, an Altman movie was, is like, you know, you just, you just hop on. Uh, you, you're not, you know, you just, it's, it's sort of a, a group experience. You know, my, he hired me to play one kind of a part. And then I got there early and I didn't know why he wanted me there early, but he did. And we would all go out to dinner and we would just go to these different restaurants around Houston and everybody would drink a lot of wine and all of a sudden across the table one night, Bob said, that's who you are. That's what you're gonna do. You're gonna wear your hair in braids like that because I had my hair in braids. And you're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna go get a whole new wardrobe for you because th that's the, you know, and he began to have a feeling of a character based on sitting around the table eating dinner in a restaurant. Catherine, Bob's wife, is the, you know, the major domo of the home. And so a lot of what 
gets done in the film gets done on at a at dinner you know with the whole cast and part and crew and and whoever wants to come and he used to say my first few ideas my first two ideas are lousy you got to keep me going until i get to my third one and so it was sort of a sitting around all night while bob riffed on things and people kind of keeping him going till he got to his third or tenth idea. A lot of the tension is, is broken off because you've had those dinners. You know how people respond um, in certain social situations. And Bob's very clever. He watches like a hawk. He just sees sort of past the surface. And he's not living in any kind of rigid notion of the movie he wanted to make. He's like making the movie as he goes along and he's he's making it based on what he's looking at. And I went to this nice cozy office and, and, the, and there's a fireplace and there's a couch and there's a desk over there and it's a um, something lion? Lionsgate. Lionsgate. Yeah. And we're talking and he never met me before and I'd never met him before. And he happened to mention uh, that he was doing a movie in the fall with actors who had to write their own country and western songs. And I said, oh, I write country and western songs. You want to hear one? He said, well, um, you, you know, we have a piano in the room. Why don't you come back? I said, no, I'll, I'll sing it now. He said, well, don't you usually write with a guitar. I said, yeah, I write with a guitar. Well, maybe you'll come back with it. I said, no, I'll sing it now. It's okay. And I sang. Well, I like to go to Memphis, but I don't know the way. And I'd like to tell you how I feel, but I don't know what to say. And I'd like to go to heaven, but I've... And he said, you've got the part. As a director, you begin to understand that your job is just not on the floor. It's really about being observant with your... And, and to make the tension to relieve the tension, to take the tension off the actors as much as possible, so that when they come to the floor, wherever you are, that is just an extended conversation. And when it was time, we never talked again, we never signed contracts, nobody said a word. Call my agent, he said, okay, time. That's like good Hollywood. So you go down to Nashville? Hollywood. Well, it was good Hollywood, you see, because there was no worry, there was no constraints, there was no papers to sign. People weren't worried about money, they weren't worried about, you know, length of time away from the per diem. It was just kind of perfect, kind of warm and nice. So I flew there and it was heaven. It was absolutely heaven. It was just wonderful. I mean, we were strapped to the, 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 uh, the, um, the microphone. The wireless mic stand. Well, what's that? The bag, the batteries. Okay, so the batteries are on the inside of your thigh, and you're mic'd here or something. Now, you can't remember that. Why would you remember that you're mic'd? You know, it's a great big place, Grand Old Opry House. You don't know where the cameras are. So you're just being Connie White at the Grand Old Opry. You were involved in the present, not fulfilling a storyboard, not fulfilling somebody's marriage to words on a piece of paper, but fulfilling what was appropriate for what the film was becoming. I was stage right, I think, and I knew there was a camera somewhere. I didn't know where it was, it was up there. I didn't see it, I can remember, and, and you just, do it. You just, you just do the life. <laughs> well, that's one reason, of course, it's so brilliant. Because he's actually having actors sort of be in their lives rather than being a, in a scene. Bob always said that the cheapest thing about making a movie is shooting film. So once you're there, I mean, come on. It doesn't mean you do 48,000 takes of the same turkey being sliced in the same way, like a commercial. It means that every time something new has presented itself. So if it's pretty good, follow it. It's a perfectly marvelous 
extraordinary task he set before himself, Mr. Altman, to just record everybody all the time, anytime they said anything, and just work it out later with all these different mics and everything so that he could get the product he wanted, which was, well, probably the disorder of the actual universe. You know? For those of us who work with Bob, I think that that is the, the thing that validated our processes to go out into the world more than anything else. That this can be done with a light hand. It can be done by giving everybody their own head. It can be done without yelling and screaming. It can be done on time and under budget. Um, it can be done in a way where one if you see something on one take and you've got that, that you shift it and say, try this. That film is liquid, so you can be spontaneous on the floor. And that does not exist much anymore. Hal Ashby, of course, an editor by trade, sort of a solitary um, very interior person. It was, he always, throughout his life, and I got to know him pretty well, was, was extremely hard to talk to. He was the kind of a filmmaker that would, uh, if you were interested, he would embrace you, and he'd love to show you cuts that he'd done, and he'd sit there working on the moviola, and, and uh, he'd be up all night and uh, uh, doing different versions of different scenes. Norman Jewison once told me that when uh, Hal came to work for him as an editor. He used to sleep on the floor of the cutting room. Uh, he didn't have any possessions. He, he didn't accumulate anything. Everybody was kind of taken aback a little bit by Hal because of his look. I mean, he was, you know, very nice and all that, but I mean, he had long hair, he had these beads, and actually he was homeless because he was living in the office at that point. He's a very gentle man. He's, you know, he had violence in him but he kept it under very, very tight control. And he was, uh, he took chances, you know? And he was a real filmmaker. He got really excited, you know? And he, he had his battles with people and um, with the established, you know, power structures. And, and he was very shrewd and smart. He really, he could charm a, a, a dead snake, you know? He was like uh, amazing. Obviously, he's a master cutter, you know, so he was very jealous of that. But, you know, I kept trying to say what I wanted to say, and then you'd be ejected, and then the editor would call and tell you, there's going to be a screening tonight. Hal doesn't want you to know about it. You know, so you'd show up anyway, and then, oh, hi, Jerry, you know. After Eight Million Ways to Die, we finished shooting, and we were a couple of percentage points within the budget. and. Uh, uh, and Hal made, you know, he'd done uh, Slugger's Wife at that point, and looking to get out at that point, and he was not popular. And uh, he was known as a guy that once, you, once he got it into the editing room, I mean, it was going to be gone forever. And uh, so a week after we finished shooting, a five-ton truck rolled up to the, to the editing room, and a couple of gorillas came in and took all the film, and that was the end of it. And I, you know, Hal took it to the, uh, you know, the DGA. And at the end of it, he said, "Oh, screw it." He says, it "Doesn't work. I'll work real hard on it, and I'll give them a film, but it's not the film they want." And uh, so they might as well cut it the way they want to cut it. The hell with it. It's like he was a very sensitive piece of litmus paper, Hal Ashby. Of all the directors that I've known, not just the ones that I've worked with as a producer, but guys I represented. I've never known anyone as light sensitive, as, as quick to anger and to rage and to feel that he's being betrayed and, and uh, fucked over and all that. But there was, underneath that, there was a gentleness. There was a very, very gentle quality and a very interesting way of looking at things. He didn't see what everyone else saw. He saw something slightly different. Oh, man. Hal Ashby is a, an unlikely spirit. He, he's one of the world's really special people, a brilliant editor, a brilliant talent, and a very sad man because he had addictions that ruined his career. But within those 
problems. He was a wonderful filmmaker. And um, there's a tragedy in his life because he should have been one of the country's great filmmakers. And his inner demons, you know, really, really took control. He'd do what he wanted to do. If it offended a studio head, then so what? There was going to be another studio, and there'd be another studio head. And by the time he got through the circle, you know, they'd all be gone and replaced. Where they screwed him up was is that they kept replacing themselves with themselves. And so, so there was a uh, kind of a, a repeat there. I think it was a combination of burnout and substance abuse and... Uh, and hard work. I mean, he really worked hard, and uh, he just kind of lost his grip at the end, you know. But he did a lot of great films. I mean, he just from back to back, he did some amazing films. And uh, you know, I think a lot of those guys like Hal would have trouble uh, being Hal the way it is now. I don't. I don't know if he could get work now. Donovich was a funny guy. You know, he was a film critic. Uh, I used to see Peter when uh, he was writing for Esquire and barely keeping alive. As a matter of fact, his, we'd go to screenings at, say, at the Director's Guild, and he was always the first person at the table to get some food. It was clearly his only meal of the day. And um, I remember I once asked him, why was it that he always seemed to be dressed in new suits that were ill-fitting? They were always a little short for him. And he looked very embarrassed the first time I asked him and did not answer. The second time I asked him, he confessed that he had become friendly with Jerry Lewis. And Jerry Lewis was convinced that he was allergic to um, cleaning fluid. So he would wear a suit or a jacket or trousers once and then give it to Peter Bogdanovich. So that's why Peter was always wearing these sort of shiny new clothes that didn't fit him. I just remember him, I was supposed to, uh, I was having the scene with Ellen Burstyn in the bedroom where she says you have to worry about babies, you know, and all that. And I lay on the bed and sling the cat off. And um, he demonstrated, he did it for me before I did it. He flung himself on the bed and, and said, the cat wasn't on there yet. But I, I didn't, I wasn't cruel to the cat. I just kind of eased it off in a careless manner. I just remember Peter rolling around the bed. I didn't know who I wanted to have sex with. They were all so attractive. I was so turned on by the experience, the creativity of it. We had about two weeks there rehearsing, and we all got into our accents. There was a boy named Lloyd Catlett who was a local that Peter hired to for us to get the accent from him. So we spent a lot of time with Lloyd doing his accent. Pretty soon we were all talking like Lloyd. And he had a, he had a part in the film. And this is a wonderful story about Lloyd who, when we first, when we first got together with him, we were all sitting kind of in a semicircle and uh, talking to Lloyd and asking him questions. And at one point, somebody asked him, um, well, what do you do for excitement around here? And Lloyd answered, mm, whoop nerves. And there was this silence, and nobody said anything. But I felt this sort of resolve pass through it that was like, all right, young man. We will take on your education. And we did. And he, during the course of the filming, went through a, a transformation. And when we were finished filming, he said, you know what you folks have done to me, don't you? We said, what? He said, you've made me unfit to live in my own hometown. So we took him with us. And uh, he became Jeff's understudy, and he's still with him today. 
I don't know why I was with Peter, but I, Peter and I often went out together. Sybil, I guess, would be in New York, and Peter would ask me to go to a party with him. And, um, you know, he called me every day. It was the oddest. It was a very odd situation. You know, I, you know, I think I definitely Peter still loved me, and um, I'm sure he was very torn by the situation. And often he, we would be together. And one night we were driving along Sunset Boulevard, and I had... You know, I I had made some money, and I had this. I think it was. I don't think I had a Mercedes yet. I had a Volvo with a with a sunroof, and we were driving along, and then there was Francis Coppola right next to us on Sunset Boulevard, and he had this huge Mercedes limousine that had been given to him by Bob Evans because of the success of The Godfather, and. You know, Peter stood up in my sunroof, you know, we waved to him, and Peter stood up and got his attention, and um, Francis got up in his sunroof, and, and they were going, you know, Peter was saying, I can't remember how many, Peter was saying five, ten nominations, and, and we were zooming along, I was driving, the chauffeur was driving, and, and then, of course, Francis had more nominations than we did, and they were yelling back and forth to each other, and we kept going right next to each other, and... It was just accelerating, you know. Only he had more than we did. No, it wasn't the night of the Oscars. I don't know when it was. It was after a party at Sue Manger's house. And Tell me the story like I... I, I, I the, to the best of my memory, the, um, the, the best of my memory, that the, the, Billy Francis and I were all in separate cars, I think. And Billy won the Oscar for French Connection, and Francis had had a huge grocer with The Godfather. And I think Billy said something like, you know, um, Oscar for you know, best director, and Francis said, biggest grocer since something or other. And I said, best film since Citizen Kane. And you know, that was, <laughs> we, were, we were out trying to outdo each other. It was something like that. Truffaut said a very important thing. Truffaut said once you get into a position where you can make movies, you no longer are able to make the movies like the movies that made you want to make the movies in the first place because you're now someone else. Peter is not someone else. He's exactly that same kid who sat in the movie theater and saw John Ford movies or Howard Hawks movies and said, I want to make movies like that. And when he stuck to that, which he did on the first three films, brilliantly, he loves old Hollywood. He just wishes that people would still want to go to see Bringing Up Baby. One night, Peter says, okay, we're going over to Barbara's. We're going to meet, you guys are ready to meet Bringing Up. We're going over to Barbara, and Ryan's going to be there, and we're going to screen The Lady Eve. And first, we're going to have dinner. So, great. Peter said, now, when we go to the screening room, he said, you guys just laugh it up. I, we've seen the movie 10 times by then. It's one of my favorite movies still, you know. How can you not laugh it up? And he said, and I'll be, I'm going to sit in, in the back there with Barbara and Ryan because I want to, you know, deal with, this let me deal with them. You just guys enjoy the movie. Fine. So we go to see, we have this wonderful dinner, and then Barbara Streisand gives us strawberries hand-dipped in chocolate. I always remember that for some reason. Popcorn that she made herself. We go to the screen room down in the basement, and this big screen drops, you know, it's like a star is born. And, uh, and Ben and I are sitting over here, and behind us, Peter Bogdanovich and Ryan and Barbara. And Lady Eve starts, and I, I, was, I just love the movie, so does Ben. You know, the minute it starts, we're chuckling and laughing, anticipating our favorite moments, and we're laughing and laughing. Peter's laughing. Not a sound coming out of Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill. Not a giggle. And I thought, how can you not, you know? And then, at one, and, and this is a true story, and Benton will, I don't know if Peter remembers it, but Benton certainly does. About halfway through the movie, Barbara says, well, that's 17 for him and only, I, I'm, see, that's only, that's 17 for her and only 10 for him. And I thought, what? And they were counting close-ups. How many close-ups Barbara Stanwyck got as opposed to how many close-ups Henry Cl and then you and Ryan and you'll say, wait a minute, that's another one for him. I mean, it, was, it was so bizarre. And anyway, it, we went on for about three, four reels. And then finally she said, I've had enough of this S word. And, uh, and the lights went on and she said, all right, fine, I know what you want to just, you know. I mean, she couldn't, she couldn't stick it out to the end of the lady, so I thought, 
we're in big trouble here. Streisand hated it, kept saying, is, are these lines funny? These lines are not funny, you know, and she would go around to everyone on the set and said, is this a funny line? I'll give you a knuckle sandwich. That was a line. How would you like a knuckle sandwich? And all the people on the set would say, no, that's not funny. They would agree with her because she was such a big star. And I wasn't scared of her at all, you know. I wasn't the slightest bit scared of her. And I kept saying to her, don't you realize that everything you do will be watched for hundreds of years? I said, I'm looking at films that were made 50 years ago, and I'm looking at the performances as women. You've got to pay attention. You better do a good job on this film, because it's forever. And she listened. You know, I don't think anybody had ever said anything like that to her. My next film was going to be a film called They All Laughed, which was the most personal film I had made up to that time and still made. And I wrote it, and it was kind of about my experiences and the experiences of a number of people that I knew about love and relationships and so on. But it was disguised, as, a, as I believe good Hollywood movies should be, uh, as a kind of a detective genre and a kind of a, kind of a comedy kind of a bittersweet comedy. Uh, and I think, to this day, I think it's certainly one of my best films. Uh, we had Audrey Hepburn, Ben Gazzara, Johnny Ritter, Dorothy Stratton. The tragedy was that about a month after we wrapped, Dorothy Stratton was murdered. Uh, a sensational murder that uh, essentially destroyed the movie as well because you know, the movie was supposed to be a bittersweet romantic comedy. The bitter part was Audrey and Ben, Audrey Hepburn's and Ben Gazzara's relationship, and the sweet part was John Ritter and Dorothy Stratton. But after Dorothy was killed, it was impossible to see the movie that way. It was just, the whole thing was sad. Because she was so incandescent and so beautiful, and the thought of her being dead as you watch this movie. The movie was never seen the way it was intended to be seen, couldn't be. And then at the same time, because of the tragedy, uh, uh, I basically went off my, the deep end, uh, went off my rocker and decided to distribute the movie myself, which was crazy. And unfortunately, nobody talked me out of it. And I blew $5 million of uh, my own money which was a lot of money in those days. It's still a lot of money. Um, and so I lost my independence. Wrote a book about Dorothy, which, was, which women liked, but generally wasn't well received, and, um, was gonna, and made, didn't make another film till for about four years. If only I had known then what I know now, I would have had a better career, but I did all right. Why do you say that? Huh? Why do you say that? Because I, you know, I would have made different decisions. I would have done certain pictures that I was asked to do and said, no, I don't want to do that. But I would have thought more in terms of longevity instead of the moment. I would have thought of planning a kind of career, but I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. I thought, well, this is, this is okay. This is a hit. No, I'll make another one. I guess that'll be a hit. I don't know, you know. And uh, I should have done the thing Ford used to say, make one for yourself, make one for them. Make one for yourself, make one for them. And I, I started to make one for myself and I wasn't thinking of them and I should have done both. So there's pictures that I wish I'd done, that I was offered, that I turned down, rather. But you were off offered The Exorcist, huh? I was offered The Godfather. I was offered The Exorcist. I was offered The Way We Were. I was offered uh, just about everything at that period, yeah. Um, and I, some I really regret not doing. Uh, Chinatown, you know. So there was a, quite a lot of things that if I'd only known, as I say, what I know now. But, you know, that's the problem with success. It comes, you know, hits you over the head and you don't know exactly what's going on. I was doing a piece for the New York Times about how some uh, film school kids finance their educations. And Francis was making 
a genre of picture that was then called, if you please, nudies, which are sort of soft core, extremely, you know, soft core. Um, and they, they, they shot these little, these little low-budget sex pictures and, and sold them, you know, and, and worked their way through school doing that. So I, I got to know him that way. Even then, he was beginning to rewrite scripts and serve as this uh, sort of brilliant young body and fender man uh, in, in, in the rewrite business. He really seemed to understand the Hollywood system and how to use it. And uh, he was always, you know, spending time with Francis was exhausting because he was always doing so many things that, you know, we'd spend time with Francis and go home and go to bed because he was just, you know, crazy man. This, the whole thing was that Francis was kind of regarded as this guy who'd sold them out. Francis was the establishment now, you know, and that was only, and there was this big break there, and uh, that was really underlined even more when he took on The Godfather. You know, here he's doing a movie, not only is he he's doing a great big Paramount movie, and it's about gangsters. He's not doing a movie about you know, the people, you know, and their struggle against, you know, capitalist oppression or whatever, or drugs or something really important. He's doing a movie about the mafia, you know. Who cares about the mafia, you know? I don't think Paramount ever did give Francis the, the, the go-ahead to shoot it. Or it was part two, I don't think. They never did say, okay, go ahead. I mean, they never got the okay. We just started shooting, you know, it was like... Uh, a two, I think it was. A t a one almost not get, didn't get started. Well, there was this, all these arguments about Brando, and then we were in a studio, like for 24 hours, shooting tests of every actor that was still living and breathing. For, you know, everybody was pulling at the shirts, and yeah, he's got to be, it's going to be him. And, uh, and uh, Bob Evans. Uh, comes around after me and says, this is absolutely, you know, it's not going to be this guy, it's going to be that guy. He will absolutely not play the part. I don't know why he's telling me this, but, but he was, you know. And of course, the opposite happened. Francis got his way on all these people, and, you know, it, it finally, but it was, it was, it was like, you know, open heart surgery for a little, the, the entire period of shooting the movie. They were, it was like this movie counterculture studio system going on over here and us shooting the movie over here and they really wanted to make it this cheap crime novel movie and you know quickly and not cause it and then to give Francis great credit I mean he, he made this uh, he reduced the novel to it was this wonderful screenplay and then uh, it wasn't until I suppose halfway two-thirds of the way through the movie that they decided they should give us the money to go to Sicily I mean, it, it, that's how it worked out, you know. And if you think of the movie, it wouldn't be very good without Sicily. So they realized they had a different movie, but it took them a long time. And I have to give Marlon Brando the um, credit for the lighting in the movie, actually, because I had to come up with something. You know, he had this makeup, and he, said, he was talking to me. He says, well, you know, I want to do this. And I kill the thing. I said, OK. Um, he says, but it has to be lit. I said, sure, I, I understand. So we did these tests, and to make a long story short, what happened was it ended up to be overhead lighting uh, because the sunken eyes and everything he had done. But I had to take, it had to be not something that was just non-selective, it had to be very selective, but I also had to move the same technique into the rest of the movie. I couldn't just use it for him. So he was his makeup and things, and so I dragged it through one, and I dragged it through two, and part of three, as a matter of fact. The picture had one problem after another. It was like, you know, it was visited by the, by the bad, bad luck, uh, um, you know, witch. But it, um, you know, I go to, I go to uh, Manila. I arrive in Manila, and I'm, you know, two days later, and there's a. So I haven't been to Manila since I was a little kid. Um, and uh, there's a guy standing there. It's, it says Metavoy Urgent. So I go up, and I'm there with Fred Roos, and you know, uh, Martin Sheen had just had a heart attack. So we go to the hotel, 
I mean, we go to the hospital, and uh, Marty's laying there, you know, with tubes from all over the place. His wife is crying. The priest is there, and I'm thinking, oh my God, this is this is really, you know, a disaster. So the doctor comes in and says, look, it's a heart attack. You know, he's obviously exhausted. He can't go back to work for another six months. And we may have to ship him back to the States. <clears throat> so I, I said, fine, I, you know, um, nothing you can say at that point. Um, I go on, get on a helicopter and go out to Pak San Han, which is where Francis is. And... Um, I'm, I ha I'm not at that point really where I panic, and I certainly don't ever show panic. So I, I'm walking with my luggage, and I'm walking by Francis, and I see Francis is there, and he's obviously having a problem with Ellie. Um, I don't know what the problem is. He said, I'll see you, you know, in about an hour or so. Uh, we'll have dinner. So we have dinner, and I said, you know, how are we going to finish this movie? He said, we'll probably never finish this movie. I said, well... Good. Now I'm trying to think, okay, now should I call the guys in New York and say, hey, I just had dinner with a guy who told me we'll probably never finish this movie. <laughs> you know, we're in for like, I forgot what it was, but it was like $30 million or something was coming up. And um, we haven't finished the ending of the movie. <clears throat> um, you know, it's like starts to look like the nightmare scenario that the movie's about, you know, apocalypse. And then Marlon arrived. And we showed him these guys doing jujitsu, firing mortars, like climbing trees and doing all this and doing rifle stuff and so on. He looked at this and parading and marching. And he went, uh-huh. So then we went and had dinner. And it turned out that Marlon had not read the book Heart of Darkness. And so Francis and Marlon, they shut down the whole company. And there's 900 people there and they go off on a riverboat and they're gone for a week. And I guess on the riverboat, Francis reads Marlin Heart of Darkness. They come back, Francis says, you know, we have a part for you as large as Marlin, maybe larger, I'm not sure. And you're going to play the Russian Jew who's in the book, who is, has all the collection of stuff and uh, heads and shrunken heads, because you never really see Kurtz I, you don't, in, the, in the Heart of Darkness. You want to hear about him. And uh, so he, uh, uh, you're going to play him, but we're going to be a photo news journalist have cameras and so on. And so we started shooting and we wrote every morning and improvised our way through the day. It was never anything written. There was never any conclusion of anything. I knew that Francis was losing everything. But rather than getting excited about it, he slowed down. He said, okay, we're waiting for the clouds. Okay, we're waiting for the rain. Okay? Uh, if, if I'm losing the farm, I'm losing the ranch, I'm losing the vineyards, I'm losing my studio, I'm losing everything, then we're going to make a good movie here. So let's just all settle down and realize that that's what we're doing. Now, that's a, that's a great attitude, man. Yeah. At Cannes that year, he was being treated as a pariah, you know, by the American press, because his film was much too expensive and much too uneven. Uh, much too, you know, uh, it, it, it really goes off the rails at the end, uh, though it has fantastic scenes, you know, again, marvel, you know, the, the, uh, the airplane scenes are marvelous. Uh, and a friend of mine said that, uh, in fact, I think it was late Richard Roud said this, he said uh, about Ka Coppola, he said, you know, and he's like a lot of people from Hollywood, like Wells and like Sturgis, President Sturgis, he says they're smart, but not smart enough. You know, they're, they're too smart for, for Hollywood, but they're not smart enough to beat Hollywood at its own game. And, uh, and that was his thing on that. And of course, Coppola went back, but he sort of recovered and so forth. But one thing I've always admired about Coppola, that he was he's very even-handed. Uh, the, the great thing about that scene in Apocalypse Now this is something a friend of mine, Steve Gottlieb, gave me that thing, is, is that, you know, the, the helicopter, you're, you're both up in the helicopters and you're down below at the Viet Cong. I mean, he is even with both of them. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't show one at the expense of the other. You know, it, it's not a moral thing, it's a, it's a visual, dramatic thing that, that he balances. He has a wonderful sense of balance. And I think that's what makes makes Godfather uh, so, so exciting, you know, these 
tremendous, you know, equilibrium there is between all the forces that are pitted against each other. I was very tired. I was working for insurance adjusters, I think. No, no, that was wrong. I worked. I was just, it was a tired kind of a day. And um, I wasn't working for insurance adjusters. Um, and, I, and I went to meet Dennis, and it was that sort of like this sort of like edifice and in a courtyard or something. And he was incredibly dynamic, but incredibly inspired and very emotional. And I thought he was brilliant. I thought he was the greatest. I was uh, put under contract to Warner Brothers when I was 18 years old, and you could go watch the editors, you could go into any sound stage and watch any of the actors and, and directors that were working at that time. Uh, we had to do a menial labor like uh, dub foreign films, but I became the voice of Oscar Werner and Hitler's Last Ten Days and these German films. Uh, I would be his American voice. So we learned how to dub. We learned how to do technical things that were, uh, uh, if we wanted to, uh, really well, and uh, we had access to all this. We didn't really have film schools in, in 1954, 55, but uh, they were just starting. But uh, So that was the school that, uh, that I learned in. You were no longer like in the pink light, and you were no longer Doris Day, and you were no longer cute, and you were no longer social, and, and none of that really mattered, and your smile wasn't the, 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 the most fetching. That, that was gone. What it was was, did you mean it? Were you in the moment? Uh, were you uh, unselfconscious? Were you were you were you uh, moved? Were you moved by the meaning to such an extent that you really couldn't control yourself? And, and that was the acting at that time. We shot tracks without any permits because you couldn't get permits to shoot on a train because somebody had died in a train accident and insurance was insane. So I snuck everybody onto the train to make tracks. I, uh, I snuck the crew, I snuck the actors, I just bought tickets, we hid the equipment under the beds. And then when nobody was looking at night, I went into the halls and shot the scenes in the halls. I went into the dining cars and paid the guys who worked in the dining cars 10 or 20 bucks and asked them to leave everything on the tables and to sit in the background. And we shot the scenes in that way. There was this major scene where this coffin with the flag draped coffin has to be carried into the uh, into the um, uh, the car the, tr the the car that carries um, mail. What is it? The mail car. Dennis started freaking out because that's a federal offense apparently and that's I said good well use the how scared you are to go in there and carry and do all of this and he said but but you know I can be put in jail. I said well you can really then use it. You've got something really strong to work and he he didn't flinch. He said, oh, oh, great. And he dove into this, and I saw how I knew nothing would happen to him. The worst thing would be somebody would say, hey, what are you kids doing? They get out of there. But he really was paranoid to the point where he was thinking he was going to end up killed or in jail or something. And yet he was willing to use that. Uh, his anxieties never over, overlapped, overcame, never dominated, never destroyed his extraordinary creative drive to try to be as, as truthful, emotionally, creatively, as he could possibly be. The audition process for, for graffiti was the most involved audition I've ever been involved in. Um, we must have, I must have read, uh, I don't know, six or eight times and always with different actors. And in my case, I, I was reading two different roles. I was, try, I, didn't, I was trying to get one of two roles. And it was like there were layers of, of people to get through because I later found out that George was so particular about casting that he, he wanted to filter everyone in, in a process that was very complex. And then finally, I found myself one day doing an improvisation with Harrison Ford, Cindy, uh, Candy Clark, um, and, and a number of the kids who eventually got into the film. And we did this, these improvs for, for tape, which were sent to George. And we were cast, in a sense, in relationship to one another. You know, he didn't just cast Richard as Kurt, he cast 
Richard as Kurt in relationship to Candy, as in relationship to, you know. George started out really as a documentary filmmaker with long lenses. And with long lenses, you didn't have to really get so close to the people. George would come up to us after we had just run the lines a little while, and he'd walk up to us and say, is that the way you want to do it? And we would say, yeah. And he would go, OK, put the camera here, put the camera there. And unlike Steven Spielberg, who gets in there and works and uses wide angle lenses and has a lot of mise en scene and things will be done in one take, to do that, you have to really, really get close and work with people. George is more aloof. He's more private. And you can see that in his movies. I think George thought that w once he cast us, we were these characters. And, what, and our impulses would tell him how to do a certain moment. Not that we dictated in, in any way. <laughs> we didn't. But he trusted us. And... Uh, and, and his directing, in a way, um, it, it, it didn't stop. It just, at the point of casting, he then turned it over to us, and then he picked it up later on. In graffiti, at, at best, it's absolutely dazzling, his car stuff. At worst, he'll have three characters and just sort of put them against the wall and shoot them, you know. But... Um, so he's more reserved. It's harder for George. I think he didn't, he didn't enjoy directing as much as Stephen. He was sort of a control freak, and directing is out of control. You know, you're doing the best you can. And, you know, we visited him during Star Wars, and he was, he was despondent because he said, I'm getting like 15% every day of what I expected to get, and it's just not happening and I hope I can fix it in post-production. And he had to invent post-production techniques to fix it. Because uh, just to, to save his ass, he had to figure out, you know, it didn't work on the set, what am I gonna do? How do, how do I fix this? He was just this guy who was this great, um, you know, mechanic, you know, and he was, and he was, you know, he pushed people. He was great, he was full of ambition. And, spirit of, you know, taking on the modern world, you know, and, you know, like, I, I could never operate machines. He says, now nah, you got to take sound so that you have to operate all the machines, you know. And now, you know, it's interesting when you see the new Star Wars, George has an empire. He has, you know, Lucas Enterprises, entertainment, whatever. And a lot of George's time is spent in meetings. So when you see the new Star Wars, there's all these meetings. You know, they'll go to a new planet. And there'll be some sword fighting, but there'll also be a meeting, you know. And then in the next planet they go to, they're sitting in different chairs. But th there's another meeting, and it's because meetings have become part of George's life, and they're important to him. So they have a lot of meetings in Star Wars. Sam Peckinpah was addicted to anything that, that uh, you could put into your any any part of your body uh, and uh, I, I remember one time uh, uh, when I was editing for him he literally you know to forget about walking a straight line I, I was afraid that he wouldn't be able to get through doorways you know he had a, a little bit of leeway and he would kind of like aim for it and just determinedly <laughs> decide he was going to get through the doorway and he would you know weave a little bit but he would get through and then I saw him uh, get into his office and his daughter called him and you never saw a man get sober so quickly <laughs> well anyway it, it, he was playing sober he was acting sober and he was speaking very slowly and carefully I did a picture with Sam Peckinpah one of my favorites of all time bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia what can I tell you? I had three meetings with him. He said the most wonderful things to me. He didn't mean one of them. He was a great con artist, a great salesman, a fabulous director. You know, you gave him the movie, he delivered the movie, the rest was bullshit. But it was so much fun. 
I mean, you know, and Alfredo Garcia is kind of a cult classic. We got a bu we got a bunch of cult classics. <laughs> Electric Light and Blue, Bring Me the Fred of Alfredo. We did um, two hundred motels. Uh, you know, all those kind of stuff that we just took chances on people, and working with Peck and Bond. Sorry, we, I think I had three meetings with him, three lunches. You know, give me a break. He's going to do what he's going to do, and you have the privilege of having him con you for a while. I, I don't think Sam ever understood really uh, who Bob was or how good he was in that movie, that because, or how good, it, I thought his music was one of the best parts of the film, and, and both Sam and his old music guy uh, never really understood it. It was, I think Sam thought that the producers had brought Bob in to make it more commercial, you know, and he resented that. I think it was the first uh, screening of a daily that Bob saw. We were watching the scene where Slim Pickens is dying uh, with Katie Hirado, and and it came back too dark, and uh, you could barely see what was going on on there. And Sam, at one point, got up and walked up and pissed on the screen, and Bob looked over at me <laughs> like, like, who the hell are we working with here? These are maniacs, you know? But, I, but when, I heard, when I heard his song, knocking on heaven's door, and it's getting dark, too dark to see, I thought, my God, he's, he's uh, working all the time. And the fact that it isn't in the director's cut just shows that Sam was still carrying old grudges, and and he just didn't understand. I don't personally. I don't think that director's cut. It's how far he got before they took the picture away. Yeah, yeah. I th I I think that that Sam, uh, as I remember, in in the in any of the talking that I had with him after, was that he came to appreciate it. You know, at the time Sam was uh, in pretty rough shape. The last time I saw Sam when he was living on a trailer out there, Paradise Park or wherever in Malibu, uh, we talked about about the, that that stuff in there. And in my opinion, it was the best you know one of the best parts of the film. And I I remember him agreeing with me. He manages to create a, like an arena where this, where this event happens, and it has a very improvisatory feeling, even though it's not improvised, but the feeling is that. I felt I learned, learned a lot about how a good director works. You know, how, how a good director makes an insecure actor feel like he's doing the right thing, you know. You get really excited around Marty because he's so excited. He's so excited about the process, and I think he really knows how to get the process moving and get everybody hooked into it. Things that I felt uncomfortable with, you know, that I felt maybe Clark Gable could have said, but I can't say it. Like, And he said to for me to cross out all the 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 direction lines in it where it says he said sharply or he said whatever just just take the words and and how would you do it you know and and uh, it worked and I've done it ever since he laughs a lot uh, he enjoys he appreciates everything that you're doing he like encourages you he said. Uh, like like rooting for you and oh yeah and you know clapping and appreciating and and you get um, it, it's like he gets you turned on you know he gets all the juices flowing I don't remember him ever not liking something you know if something didn't work it got edited out but on the set everything seemed like um, like a really needed contribution and. Um, he's appreciative. 
He's appreciative of each person's creative effort. Marty's editing New York, New York, and in another set of rooms, he's editing The Last Waltz. And we knew we'd really hit a home run in the sense that the music was of an extraordinary quality. You know, everybody who played, played brilliantly. Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, Dr. John, Muddy Waters, just everyone was precise and on the mark. So, but Robbie, who was in his own kind of chemical thing, figured that to be appealed to everybody, it needed a country singer and it needed one more R&B thing. So the idea is, well, well, we'll just do this little pickup shoot on the soundstage with Emmy Lou Harris and with the Staple Singers. And the little pickup shoot turned into, you know, Marty wanting to do the most elaborate crane shots that had ever been done in a musical ever. And again, because he was still editing, we had to start shooting at 11 at night and finish at seven in the morning. So here is this largest soundstage uh, on the MGM lot with a crew of a hundred people for three nights, um, and you know basically all of Hollywood showing up, and you know mountains of cocaine being shoveled, and it was it was crazy. Robbie had been thrown out of his house by his wife, and Marty had gotten his house. So Robbie moved into Marty's house, and they then proceeded to make sure that they saw every single sunrise for the next six months. <laughs> and, you know, I, I'll never forget, you know, the, one of the assistant film editors on The Last was calling me one day and said, if I get one more call at three in the morning about a brilliant idea that I have to go up to the Mulholland house immediately to work on, I'm quitting, you know. And it was that, it was these two geniuses were pushing each other on and fueling each other on and couldn't let go. And it, and you know, continue to recut and recut and remix and remix and Robbie, would treat the dubbing stage as if it was a recording studio, except it was five times as expensive as a recording studio because there were three mixers and then there were eight guys back behind the wall, you know, putting up reels. So it was, it was a, a little crazy. I felt like we were two kids on a, ra on, a, on a river trip somehow, because Stephen had a gaiety about him in this, and I did too. I, I thought, this is cool, let's make this crazy movie. And Stephen did not know what this looked like yet. So he would say to me all the time, so you're looking up in awe, more awe. <laughs> he was never innocent, you know. He was always very sophisticated, very opportunistic. But he had a kind of wonderful, you know, flippancy about him, you know, and an innocence. I mean, I guess you'd call it innocence. I mean, he just, he just did what he did. He didn't, he, you know, there was nothing sneaky about Stephen. You know, and reading books about him, especially Julia Phillips, she was always angry at him. She thought he was, uh, you know, he was trying to portray himself one way and be another. He never did. He was, he, he was Stephen. He had, was very savvy about um, playing these old folks at the studios, as we saw it, playing the old folks for all they were worth and getting out of them what he wanted to. He was always brave enough to, uh, to not pretend to know what he didn't know, and uh, which was not true of everybody in the room. Spielberg, who is just a kid, you know, coming out of film school, basically, and, and doing his first feature, uh, for, for theaters, you know, Sugarland Express. He had ideas, he wanted to try things which was never done before, 
and uh, like shooting half of a movie inside of a car, you know, that never did it before. And we needed a special camera for that, and the Panavision devel developed the Panaflex in those days. So finally, we got the Panaflex to go inside of a car and shoot sound and make it uh, 180 inside the car, you know, uh, with, with sound as we are shooting. So he, is a, he was an experimenter. We were on this plane. He says, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He says, you remember when we were doing Jaws? I said, yeah. He says, you remember when the shark didn't work? Yeah. You remember when, like, you were on camera and I, I had to tell you things like, ooh, look at that shark, and there was no shark there? Yeah. Do you ever feel stupid? <laughs> I said, Stephen, don't, don't go there. <laughs> You're my authority figure here. Don't, don't, don't. Because he said I, that he oftentimes had felt stupid asking us to do that. Ooh, look at that big fish. Hey, 25-footer. Hey, <laughs> you know. And there was no, nothing there. Well, that was the entire experience of Close Encounters. It, it was... More? Less? Less. <laughs> I mean, for people that have become very, very rich and powerful, he, there's still a, a great deal of him that's the same. Um, he's like a head of state, so he doesn't he lives in a very isolated condition in some ways, but, you know, he's still the same guy. One of the interesting things that didn't occur in that book that was written, the... Easy Riders, yeah. Yeah. What, they missed the humor. You know, they missed how much fun it was to be in the company of all this chaos. And yeah, there was, you know, th th somehow it got confused with drugs. It wasn't all drugs, you know. Uh -huh. It was, there, w there was this euphoria about getting away with something and <clears throat> being in a, in a time and place when your energy, people said yes to your energy, basically. And now all you get is no. So whatever that, that, that lift is that you get with being given permission has subsided. And, you, and there's a flatness to stuff now because people have to fight so hard to get the first yes that by the time you get it, you basically say, screw it. I don't care if we do this thing or not, you know. Well, not quite that flat, but it's a, there's a, there's a different kind of electricity. And I, and the book was not uh, honest, I think, in that. I had one criticism of the book, Easy Rider. It's that I think it made so much of the intrigues and rivalries and um, uh, rumor mongering and sexual intrigues about all of these people that it overlooked the book. The main problem with the book to me is that it ignored the sense of fun, camaraderie, and real joy at getting the work done. I think there's a number of problems with the book. One is a very sort of predictable writer's problem, which is he comes up with an interesting thesis. And then rather than following the thesis to wherever it takes him, when it starts going, not going where he wants it to go, he starts taking the films and the filmmakers and twisting them in order to make them fit the thesis. And in my particular case, the thesis demanded that as the period came to an end, my creative life came to an end, and I was no longer an important or interesting filmmaker. Now, I, I could tell from talking to him, this is where he was headed. And I had just finished a film called Affliction. And I said, I said, you know, this is as, as bold and original and uh, out, out of the mainstream as anything I've ever done. I, I don't see, you know, uh, this is a sellout film. And I asked him, I said, you know, you should really see this film, Affliction. But he, I couldn't get him to see it. Because he, he had made up his mind that my career was over and therefore the Affliction couldn't be uh, anything but a sellout. I read one chapter. I didn't read Raging Bulls. 
uh, Easy Rider Raging Bulls. I read one chapter. In that one chapter, Peter Fonda called me a fascist punk. My ex-brother-in-law, Bill Hayward, said I was the worst editor he had ever seen. And Buck Henry, who was living with my ex-wife, Brooke, said uh, there was no director. The movie directed itself. Now, at that point, I just, I, I, that was enough for me to read. And then Nicholson had one of the great lines, I think, about the book when they asked him, have you read Easy Rider, Raging Bulls? And he said, no, thank you. I never read fiction. So. I'm going to put this in. <laughs> I'll put it in. Well, the initial impulse um, you know, that led to this book, I was working at Premier Magazine at the time, and I was desperate to write another book. Uh, and I was, because I was bored and I was tired of um, you know, this celebrity journalism, which is what um, I was doing there. And I had um, done a profile of Martin Scorsese for Cape, Peg to Cape Fear. And I had had a lot of fun doing it. He's a really smart guy, and his stories are really interesting. And I was going to do a Martin Scorsese book, um, and then, which he agreed to do. And then when I sort of followed up on it, um, somehow he, I, I was finding he wasn't returning my phone calls. So I thought, well, this Martin Scorsese book, you know, there had already been a bunch of them, and the whole idea was that he was going to, you know, um, he was going to. Um, cooperate with it, and if he didn't cooperate with it, which seemed to be increasingly uh, likely, then where was my Martin Scorsese book? So I started going around to, I wrote a proposal, started going around to publishers, and I got into some conversation over when I was at Simon & Schuster about the 70s in general, you know, and they seemed to be interested in a book about, um, you know, first I guess they wanted, maybe it was they wanted Scorsese's Circle, which was like Brian De Palma, the movie Bratz, I guess, and that seemed kind of narrow because a lot of the more interesting directors weren't part of that little group. Uh, and so anyway, we started talking about the 70s in general, and um, I had already done a lot of interviewing with some of these people um, for Premiere. I mean, I had done several pieces on Warren Beatty, I had done Paul Schrader, uh, and I was, you know, I'd done, I had done Coppola. I was interested in them because they were, you know, these were the giants of uh, the cinema that I had grown up with. You know, the 70s was a really wild era. I mean, I mean that was, that was, I knew that going in because, as I said, I'd already interviewed some of these people. And I'd heard them talk about the 70s with this enormous nostalgia. These were the good old days. These were the days where people were making really good movies and you got peer approval. Beatty said that to me. You got peer approval for, write, for, for making a good movie. Um, you know, people recognized it as a good movie. And there was encouragement to do that. Now it's encouragement to make a movie that makes a lot of money. It's a completely different mindset then than it is now. Um, and, and you started listening to people talk about these movies. You'd have to be a moron and talk about their lives. Or you'd have to be an imbecile not to realize that you were listening to really, you know, people were telling really fascinating stories. And the more you learned about how crazy everyone's behavior was, I mean, you couldn't not use that material. I mean, um, Martin Scorsese running down Mulholland Drive without any clothes on, chasing some girl. I mean, whacked out on coke. I mean, how could you not use it? Dennis Hopper firing a gun off his door, over his daughter's head. Um, hard not to use it. Now, um, when the book came out, many people thought, said, you know, oh, this is just gossip, especially the people in the book. This is just gossip. You know, he's just trying to make a buck. Like, they never tried to make a living. Um, if, as if that were like, you know, <laughs> beyond the pale. However, there, there was a real rationale for using this material, which is when you look at the arc of their careers and you see how um, promising their early work was and how, uh, you know, problematical their later work was, uh, that was not an accident. It was a lot of it was because of the drugs, you know. So it was impossible to understand um, what happened to these people and why their careers, uh, in many instances, uh, burned out so quickly, why they burned out so quickly. And, be, and I mean, you look at some of the earlier generation of directors like John Ford, and people would work until their 70s and 80s. I mean, some of these guys were finished by the time they were 35, you know, and you wonder, obviously, you have to ask why. I just think there are a lot of good stories in the book, you know, there's no get around, getting around that. 
You know, and I got obsessed with those stories, I have to say. I mean, people did criticize the book for being too much gossip, and it's true that it was such a whacked out period that, you know, I had to stop myself sometimes, you know, because I, I could just spend, you know, I could have spent another couple of years investigating Bert Schneider, you know, and, um, and he, I could have gone off into Huey Newton, you know, which is a fascinating story. And, you know, wherever you turned, you know, I, th I, would, th I would be doing like Scorsese and I'd think, God, this is like really interesting. And then you go to somebody else and like, this is even more interesting. And it was like, it was like you were like a, a starving person at this table laden with like these delicacies and this food and you couldn't stop eating. That's the way I felt. You know, it was like, who would have thought, you know, one person after another, Billy Freakin, another maniac, you know, uh, God, you know, as soon as you looked into it, um, you'd find out stuff that was just mind-boggling. So, you know, I think that, you know, after a while, you know, just cram it into all one, to one book. But <coughs> because you could certainly write, and people have written many, and I'm sure there will be many, many fascinating biographies about every single person in that book. So you, you get to kind of skim the cream if you do, do them all in one book. Did you ever get to Lucas? Yeah, I did. And was he cooperative? Well, yeah, he was hard to get to, but it took years to get to Lucas. Um, I mean, this whole, they were really pissed off, you know. Uh, with Spielberg, I had to submit a list of questions, which I always hate to do. And um, I tried to make them as bland and innocuous as possible, but I think there were one or two questions that um, kind of raised a, a red flag. And so I flew out there specifically to do him, and he canceled it like 20 minutes before the interview. And it was uh, really a drag. And then I had, a the way I finally got him was I, got a, I finally got an assignment from Premiere to do um, one of those, um, uh, you know, um, Jurassic Park films, I think the second one. And um, so once I got him on the set, he was terrific, you know, because um, there, there's a lot of downtime between takes and uh, I got him you know he started talking about it and answering the questions very freely and he was wonderful As, um, ditto Coppola was a little hard to get uh, the, the person who was hardest to get uh, was Burke Schneider um, who um, had a reputation of being extremely reclusive hates the press I finally got sort of got Burt by you know, it was one of those phone calls where he was telling me how he wasn't going to do the interview, but in the course of telling me how he wasn't going to do the interview, he did, in fact, to sort of do an interview. Spady's always hard to do um, because he's very cagey, but he was very, you know, if you try hard enough, I mean, there's, I always say with Beatty, it's like a very high shooting ratio. You know, um, you have to do a lot of interviewing with Beatty to get a little stuff, but the stuff you get is very worthwhile, you know, so it pays off in the end. You just have to work hard at it. Billy Freakin, I sent him a fax, and he was on the phone to me, like, in five minutes, and it was great. He was very open, made himself very available. He was terrific. You know, and they were all very nice to me, you know, and they welcomed me, and they told me their stories. And, um, and they didn't know what I knew, and I knew what I knew, and I knew who else I talked to. So you go in there thinking, you know, and, and, you, and you go in there being grateful that, they've, that they're letting, you know, giving you this interview time, and you like them, and they're very nice to you, and yet you know, you know that so-and-so that you'd, been, you'd interviewed the day before had told you these horrendous stories about them. Well, then your choice is you're not going to use the stories, or you're going to... Uh, or you're going to use them and feel like a shit, you know? Or you're going to sort of tell them you're going to use them so they're prepared for them. I sort of tried to do that a couple times, especially to Bogdanovich, because, as I said, I really liked him. And I realized, you know, after you interview Polly Platt and she's telling you, you know, what, what, what she had for breakfast every day and what kind of toothpaste she used and you telling you everything about this relationship. And Bogdanovich, you know, men being men and they're sort of more closed, it's hard to get at it. And plus, because he didn't act very well. He had a lot more to hide than she did, or to, or to not to hide, but you know, he had more to lose, I guess, by being. I kept saying, Peter, you know, Polly said this and Polly said that, you know, you don't come off too well in some of these stories. Do you want to, like, tell me a little more? Of maybe, like, you know, you, what I meant to say, it was hard, you know, I can portray you more sympathetically, and I wanted to portray him more sympathetically because it's no fun having black and white characters, and I liked him. 
you know, he, and he was a very talented director and in some ways still is. But sometimes it doesn't quite work because you can't quite, you know, um, I guess divulge, you know, put all your cards on the table. And then, you know, the book comes out and you feel really awful sometimes. You know, you, you know you've hurt people that, have t that you've... Um, that you've, you know, that have to some degree trusted you because you do build up a certain kind of trust. I mean, I know you know what I'm talking about because uh, it's, and it's intrinsic to the relationship between the journalist and the interviewer and the subject to some degree. That's Janet Mal Malcolm's point, you know, that you can't avoid betraying people and to some degree that's true. I mean, once you decide to do it, it does raise all these, you know, kinds of ethical issues that are, um, you know, can be hard to deal with. You don't reconcile it. Either you, either you sort of don't do it and get out of the kitchen, you know, or you do it and you take the, you know, you take all the, the shit that comes your way for having done it. Right after the book came out, um, I, I was invited to a um, sort of a party for Bullworth. Um, so I, I went and um, and Beatty was fine, otherwise I wouldn't have been invited to the party. But the first person I ran into was um, Bogdanovich. Um, and so I, I'm not big on confrontations myself. Um, and so I, uh, I kind of, there were a lot of people there already, so I, and I, he didn't, I don't think he saw me. So I kind of made a wide arc around him and I ran, crashed into Paul Schrader, who, um, said something like, you know, you had this wonderful opportunity and you blew it. You know, you had great access, but all you did was gossip. Um, so, you know, I wasn't going to argue with him. I, um, I said, well, I'm sorry you didn't like the book, Paul, you know, and um, that was that. But the, the best, uh, <laughs> the best um, of this kind of story, about two years later, three years later, I was invited on a cruise by um, Bob Shea, the head of New Line. And Bob says, well, by the way, Francis um, Coppola is on, on the ship with you. I said, great, you know. And I hadn't talked to him, and I'd said some really terrible things about him. So I thought, well, I'll just avoid him. You know, the trip was like eight days long, and, you know, after I was on the ship for a, a little while, it's a small ship, I realized this is a small ship, I can't just avoid him. That's a stupid, you know, you can't, there's no way you can avoid him. Every time I open one of these big, uh, heavy metal doors, Francis could be on the other side. Everybody on the cruise had to do a little performance, sing for their dinner, in this big um, room where everybody gathered, where the bar was and stuff. So, so I thought, all right, you know, rather than drag this out, I'm going to go right up to him, take the bull by the horns. So I walked up to him and I put my hand out and said, hi, I'm Peter Biskin, remember me? And it's just like, looks at me like, I'm, you know, I've got a dead fish in my hand. <laughs> So he starts in on me, he starts saying, you know, you know, how could you have interviewed Marsha Lucas? You know, she hates me, you know. She always blamed me for breaking up um, her marriage to uh, George, you know. And, I, you know, you, you should have, he always had this thing where he wanted to read all his quotes. I said, well, people don't, you should have let me read all the quotes. I said, well, you don't do that, Francis. You know, that's just not, you know, no journalist is going to do that to you. Playboy does that. To, when they do their Playboy interviews, and there had been this great Playboy interview with him years and years ago, like when The Godfather came out. So he always thought of that as a paradigm, apparently, of how he should relate to journalists or journalists should relate to him. I said a lot of people burned out. He said, who burned out? So I was going to say, well, you burned out, Francis, but of course I couldn't quite bring myself to say it, and I didn't because I was trying to um, be nice. So Francis, after, after a while, um, this back and forth, and then Francis uh, walks up, gets up, walks, grabs up, grabs the microphone from me and says, you know, very grandly, okay, I forgive you, um, Peter Biskin, you know, whatever. So after it was over, I was sitting with some people, the few people who had actually talked to me, because then that, by that, Francis had mobilized everyone against me. And, and somebody pointed out that, um, you know, the, the, something like, I forgive you, or the words that, um, that, um, Al Pacino, as Michael Corleone speaks to Fredo on a boat before Fredo is shot. 